One of the things that has ensured that Canadians have and continue to have confidence in our immigration system is that we have a robust, responsible immigration system that is also flexible. There have been many times over the past years and decades that Canada has adjusted its approach on immigration. Just think about the pandemic, for example, where we stopped immigration. We closed our borders for a long stretch in order to keep Canadians safe to respond to the crisis we were going through at that moment. What that meant was once the pandemic uh, closures were done, we had significant labor shortages. We needed to get our economy rolling again. We listened to business. We listened to colleges and universities. And we boosted the number of people coming into this country. That was a response to the COVID slowdown and shutdowns. But now, our economy is in a different place. We've seen massive economic, and massive population growth over the past years, particularly in the area of temporary workers and temporary residents. And we are now saying, okay, we need to let our communities, our, our, our infrastructures catch up to the population. And that's why we're pausing population growth by reducing immigration numbers for the next two years so we can get back pragmatically to a place where Canada can once again grow the way we all know we're going to need to in the coming decades. But getting things back under, under the, uh, uh, to a responsible level is something that a responsible government does. It's certainly something we did lots of times during COVID when we put forward a measure and realized, okay, a few weeks later, a few months later, we needed to adjust it or end it or shift it. This is still echoes of um, a, a pandemic that continues to have impacts uh, on what we're doing. Mr. Miller, uh, public opinion data suggests that Canadians are beginning to sour on immigration. There was a recent poll from Abacus that showed 50% of people think immigration is actually harming the country. Is today's announcement an admission that, that high immigration levels were a large contributor to the ongoing cost of living crisis? Look, as I've said before, uh, it is easy to blame immigrants for everything. Uh, it is also undeniable that the volume of, of migration has contributed to affordability, but there's some nuance there. To what degree, to what extent? You can't go around saying that all the ills of society are caused by immigration. It doesn't make sense, but we've heard certain provincial premiers say that. It's unfair, it's unresponsible, it's actually damaging to the, to the economy, including the same consensus that we're talking about today. No denying as well that that uh, consensus is under challenge and threat in countries like Canada. Uh, and, and we're lucky to have parties that uh, aren't outwardly hostile towards immigrants currently. I think it's very important to keep that consensus because um, you, you, you can say it's under threat, but if you're, if, if you're on the sidelines playing footsies with people with extreme views, I think that shows through. Or if you're using it and weaponizing it during an election cycle to your own benefit, uh, and often you see that backfire, well, that, is, that continues to uh, attack the consensus. I'm really glad that in the latest Enveronics poll that went into a little more uh, detail than the Abacus poll did, that you see still positive views towards immigration, but questions about the volume, and legitimate questions about the volume. And I think that's fair. Uh, the Prime Minister acknowledged that uh, that volume is one that you can certainly question and the decisions that were made to increase that. But there are, are benefits that came with that. So it's, this isn't black and white. Uh, it's about an important cohort of the population that come here with great hope and contribute to the Canadian dream. They will continue to do so. This is still an ambitious plan, but it's a reasonable one uh, that puts more control back into the federal hands to make sure that we are properly steering that population in a way that, that immigrant population in a way that's reasonable and fair to all Canadians and the immigrant groups that are coming in. I mean, uh, some of the attitudes we hear are from more recent groups of Canadians that um, align with Canadians that have been here a little longer. So it's not about one group against the other. Uh, it's a consensus that, uh, that does get challenged, but I think we still have it and we need to fight hard to preserve it. And I, sorry to speak so long, but I actually care about this. You see uh, what happens when that consensus erodes. Uh, countries that we have perhaps uh, looked up to in the past, uh, my family is part Swedish, and you see what's happening there. Uh, you see what's happening 
for example, in Germany. And I think that is something, it's a lesson for us. And you see what's happening to the south of us. And that's a lesson for us to learn. And we have to constantly fight for it. My biggest reproach with chambers of commerce and with groups that have benefited very much from immigration, when I meet with them, they're all telling me, including provinces, that they want more control over immigration, is that you have to stop fighting for it because we've all gotten lazy about the value of immigration to Canada. And I think it's something uh, that we need to realize, let it absorb, and continue to fight for it. Um, at the same time, I'm not going to call people names that have been questioning the volume. Uh, it, it, the reality is that volume is one that on this particular point of time has been uh, very aggressive. It's contributed to keeping us out of a recession, but it's come with some challenges. And that's why I think today's plan is responsible fundamentally. Uh, just as a follow, is it fair to say that those questions that Canadians have have been around for a while? Like some experts have been saying that this system is has been barreling out of control for, for several years now. What, what took so long to pull the trigger on this? You know, look, I think you can certainly have some reflection on, on the timing of this. Uh, we did, and the Prime Minister was quite clear about that, face, let's hope, a once-in-a-lifetime event in, in, in the COVID pandemic with, I think, uh, labour shortages coming out, going into it and coming out, uh, and we adjusted. Uh, did we take too long to adjust? I think there's some responsibility there to assume. Uh, it, isn't unique, it isn't only, uh, I would say, the federal government that has that responsibility. Y you just look at the jurisdiction that provinces fail to exercise when it comes to regulating uh, international students and the institutions that they have clear, they will clamor from the treetops that they have exclusive jurisdiction over education uh, and the colleges that were failed to be regulated. Auditors General time after time said uh, that they needed to adjust. What we failed to do, um, uh, I, what I would say that we did for too long is we trusted them. We trusted them for too long and now I have to take some very difficult decisions that make me into uh, you know a federal education minister and uh, you know a an armchair demograph and an economist, and that's not my role. I'm an immigration minister, and the deeper I go into those jurisdictions, um, the fewer tools I actually have, and the more questionable it becomes constitutionally. So this is about assuming responsibility, making sure that provinces step up, and there are plenty of measures in this, in this plan that ensure provinces will step up, not only in making sure they do their jobs with international students, but also with asylum seekers, and we're ready to have that conversation, because um, if we fail to be coordinated, Canadians continue to question that, and that continue, contributes to the erosion of the consensus. Uh, I, my brain doesn't work that way, like with the language. Categories where you're cutting and your obligations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, Rafi, to, to, to Melanie's question is a really important one. Uh, this plan for the next year has an economic envelope that is about 59%. Uh, the family reunification one is at 24% and the rest is humanitarian. There have been cuts relatively proportional in, uh, in all areas. Um, what we certainly wanted to do uh, is to make sure that we were respecting our humanitarian commitments. Uh, they are significant. Um, conscious of the fact that we have made a lot of commitments over the last few years and they are ones that are not only and I think they're the right ones to do, but they do cost a lot of money because you're taking people from a trauma situation, it costs a tremendous amount of, ma amount of money to resettle someone. Um, it's the right thing to do, but we've made really important commitments to Afghanistan, which we've exceeded. We're now at 53,000, whereas we had publicly targeted 40. Um, we've welcomed Ukrainians in an unprecedented amount. We've welcomed Syrians in an unprecedented amount. Uh, and other programs, including the Gaza program. Uh, that does have an impact on our ability, and we can't deny that, but our ability to, uh, to act in other areas. Uh, and those are the difficult compromises we need to make. My effort in making this plan was to make sure that it respected our public commitments and do it at a pace that, um, that lived up to the expectations of Canada. But again, this is, uh, these, these are difficult choices, but they're ones I think I don't think Canadians would forgive us for if there were radical cuts in, in that because they've demanded us election upon election and usually during an election that we act. We've made those commitments and it's important for us to respect them. Thank you. Ceci conclut la conférence de presse. This concludes the press conference.